we're looking for a new apartment to move into. Right. Uh, so let's look outside the solar system. Do you think you've you've spoken about exoplanets as well? Yeah. Uh, do, do you think there's um, possible homes out there for us uh, outside of our solar system? There are lots and lots of homes, possible homes. I mean, there there's a planetary system around nearly every star you see in the sky. And one in five of those is thought to have a roughly Earth-like planet. You know, and that's a relatively new... Yeah, it's a new discovery. Exciting. I mean, the, the Kepler satellite, which was flying around uh, above Earth's atmosphere, was able to monitor the brightness of stars with exquisite detail. And they could detect planets crossing the line of sight between us and the star, thereby dimming its light for a short time, ever so slightly. Yeah. And it's it's amazing. So there are now thousands and thousands of these exoplanet candidates, of which something like 90% are probably genuine exoplanets. And you have to remember that only about 1% of stars have their planetary system oriented edge on to your line of sight, mm -hmm. which is what you need for this transit method to work, right? Some arbitrary angle won't work, and certainly perpendicular uh, to your line of sight, that is in the plane of the sky won't work because the 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 planet is orbiting the star and never crossing yeah. your line of sight. So the fact that um, you know they found planets orbiting about one percent of the stars that they looked at in this field of one hundred and fifty plus thousand stars, they found planets around one percent. You then multiply by the inverse of one percent, which is you know right one percent is about how many what the fraction of the of the stars that have their planetary system oriented the right way and that already back of the envelope calculation tells you that uh, of order 50 to 100% of all stars have planets okay mm -hmm. and then they've been finding these earth like planets etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are many potential homes the problem is getting there okay yeah. so then a, a typical bright star sirius uh, the brightest star in the sky maybe not a typical bright star, but it's 8.7 light years away. Okay. So uh, that's, that means the light took 8.7 years to reach us. We're seeing it as it was about nine years ago. Yeah. Okay. So then, you know, you ask how long would a rocket take to get there at earth's escape speed, which is 11 kilometers per second. Okay. And it turns out it's about a quarter of a million years, okay? <laughs> now, that's 10,000 generations, okay? Let's say a generation of humans is 25 years, right? Yeah. So you'd need this colony of people that is able to sustain itself, all their food, all their waste disposal, all their water, all yeah. their recycling of everything. For 10,000 generations, they have to commit themselves to living on this vehicle, mm -hmm. right? I just don't see it happening. What I see potentially happening, if we avoid self-destruction, intentional or unintentional here on Earth, is that machines will do it, robots that can essentially hibernate. They don't need to do much of anything for a long, long time as they're traveling. And moreover, if some energetic charged particle, some cosmic ray hits the circuitry, it fixes itself, right? Machines can do this. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a form of artificial intelligence. You just tell the thing, fix yourself, basically. And right. then when you land on the pro on the planet, start producing copies of yourself, initially from materials that were perhaps sent, or you just have a bunch of copies there. And then they set up you know, factories with which to do this. I mean, this is very, very futuristic, but it's much more feasible, I think, than sending flesh and blood yeah. over interstellar distances a quarter of a million years to even the nearest stars, you're subject to all kinds of charged particles and radiation. You have to, you know, shield yourself really well. That's, by the way, one of the problems of going to Mars is that it's not a three-day journey like going to the moon. You're out there for the better part of a year or mm -hmm. two, and you're exposed to lots of radiation, you yeah. know, which typically doesn't do well with living tissue, right? <laughs> or living tissue doesn't do well with the radiation. 